sister. Wait, I didn't like I that one. You. I didn't like that one. Girlfriend. I ain't like that one. I, you I know, didn't girlfriend, like that one. Uh -uh. this is exactly why I didn't like it. We ain't a group today. That meant that we weren't supposed to be doing as well as we were doing. Gladys King, the famous R&B singer, has finally addressed the rumors about Diana Ross's life and career. For years, there have been all sorts of speculations, but Gladys has set the record straight by sharing what really happened. She's put an end to all those rumors once and for all. You friends again, you and Diana Ross? We never were really friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you friends you know? with me? Yeah, I'm always gonna be cordial to anybody. Mm -hmm. You keep your drama, you know? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna take me with you over there. When we think of an icon, Diana Ross is the first name that pops into our heads. She's an absolute treasure with a stunning legacy that has transformed music history. However, the industry lost a star too soon. Let's dive deep into the controversies surrounding her life. Diana Ross was born in Detroit, Michigan on March 26, 1944. She was the second of six children born to Ernestine and Fred Ross Sr. Her mom named her Diane, but due to a mistake on the birth certificate, it read Diana. Despite this, her family and friends in Detroit always called her Diane. Diana grew up with her sisters Barbara and Rita and her brothers Arthur, Fred Jr., and Wilbert, who was nicknamed Chico. Raised in a Christian household, specifically Baptist, the Ross family lived at 635 Belmont Street in Detroit's North End, close to Highland Park, Michigan. Their neighbor was none other than Smokey Robinson. When Diana was seven, her mother fell seriously ill with tuberculosis, so her parents sent the kids to live with their grandparents, Reverend William Moten and his wife, in Bessemer, Alabama. Once her mother recovered, Diana and her siblings moved back to Detroit. On her 14th birthday in 1958, Diana Ross's family moved to the working-class Brewster Douglas housing projects on St. Antoine Street. Diana attended Cass Technical High School, a four-year college prep magnet school in downtown Detroit. Aspiring to become a fashion designer, she took classes in clothing design, millinery, pattern making, and tailoring. She also took modeling and cosmetology classes in the evenings and on weekends and participated in various school activities, including the swim team. In 1960, Diana made history by becoming Hudson's downtown Detroit store's first African-American bus girl. To make some extra money, she also provided hairdressing services to her neighbors. She graduated from Cass Tech in January 1962. So how did Diana become the icon we know today? Can her skills be traced back to her childhood? Stay tuned to uncover the truth about Diana Ross. Diana Ross started her singing journey in school by forming a girl group inspired by a local all-male group. Her professional career started in 1959, when she and some neighborhood friends created the pop-soul vocal group known as the Primettes, which later became the Supremes. This name was inspired by their sister act association with the Primes, who eventually became the Temptations. Diana has captivated audiences for over five decades with her unique blend of soul and style. Her delicate soprano voice, impeccable fashion sense, and perfect songs have always set her apart. The Supremes quickly made a name for themselves, catching the eye of Smokey Robinson, who helped them land a recording contract. This was the start of Diana's incredible career. After a brief stint with Lupine Records, they got a chance to audition for Motown. In August 1960, they auditioned for Barry Gordy. However, when he found out they were only 16, he told them to come back after graduating from high school. The group didn't give up and returned to Motown, eventually signing with Barry Gordy in 1961. They considered several names like the Melodies, the Sweet Peas, and the Jewelettes before settling on the Supremes. The group, consisting of Diana Ross, Mary Wilson, and Florence Ballard, later replaced by Cindy Birdsong in 1967, signed with Motown Records in 1960 and released their first single the following year. Despite their talent, they were initially nicknamed the No-Hit Supremes by Motown employees, but they persevered and went on to become one of the most successful and influential groups in music history. However, the Supremes didn't become famous overnight. It took some time to create the distinctive look and sound that eventually made them legendary. For three years, Barry Gordy tried pairing the group with different musicians and songs without success. 
Finally, in 1964, the songwriters Holland Dozier Holland gave the Supremes their first number one hit with Where Did Our Love Go? The unique sound featured Diana Ross's precise, breathy voice, chiming bells, and a subtle rhythm section. Between July 1964 and May 1965, the Supremes had a streak of five consecutive number one hits on the pop charts, including Baby Love, Stop, In the Name of Love, and Someday We'll Be Together. In 1967, the group was renamed Diana Ross and the Supremes, hinting at Diana's upcoming solo career, which she launched in 1970. Over the past five decades, Diana has sold over 100 million records, released 57 albums, and earned numerous number one hits and awards. Diana Ross's solo career began in 1970. She has released 25 studio albums and numerous singles and compilations, selling more than 100 million records worldwide. Her debut solo album featured the hit Ain't No Mountain High Enough, her first number one single without the group. In 1972, she starred in the biographical film about Billie Holiday, Lady Sings the Blues, which received spectacular reviews and earned her a Golden Globe Award. Five years later, she starred as Dorothy in The Wiz, an African-American adaptation of The Wizard of Oz. In 1980, Diana released the album Diana, which included the hit single Upside Down. This song became her fifth number one single and was also hugely popular internationally. Diana remains her most successful album, reaching number two on the Billboard 200 chart and staying on the chart for 52 weeks. Throughout her solo career, Diana Ross has continued to perform on film, television, and stage, solidifying her status as an enduring icon. In 1980, Diana Ross left Motown and signed a $20 million contract with RCA, the largest amount ever paid to a single artist at the time. While with RCA, she released several gold-certified albums and numerous hit singles. In 1983, the Supremes reunited for the TV special Motown 25, Yesterday, Today, and Forever, performing one song. Ross performed at the Super Bowl in 1996 and presented at the MTV Video Music Awards three years later. She proposed a Supremes reunion tour in 2000, but Mary Wilson and Cindy Birdsong declined due to contract disagreements. The tour continued with two replacements but was canceled after its first shows due to poor sales. Diana Ross has received numerous accolades, including singing for the Queen of England. In 2007, she earned two stars on Hollywood's Walk of Fame and was honored by the Kennedy Center for her influence on American culture. She continues to be active in music, releasing records and touring in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. On November 16, 2016, Ross was named one of the 21 Presidential Medal of Freedom recipients, the nation's highest civilian honor. In 2023, the Supremes co-founders Ross, the late Mary Wilson, and Florence Ballard received the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Ross became the first woman to win this award twice, having earned a solo honor in 2012. As she approached her eighth decade, Diana slowed down her career. On March 26, it was announced that the Grammy winner would be the face of Saint Laurent by Anthony Vaccarello's new campaign for the French brand's Spring 2024 collection. However, Diana was something more even than this. Her life was filled full of secrets and thoughts nobody knew. It's tough for most people to see past their flaws, but Gladys Knight isn't one of them. Gladys Knight, the Empress of Soul, is stepping up to clear the air about the rumors surrounding Diana Ross's seemingly flawless reputation. She's got an impressive career like Diana's, and she's ready to spill the beans. Gladys rubbed shoulders with Diana Ross on stage countless times. So, if anyone can give us the real deal about Diana, it's Gladys. Diana is undeniably one of the greatest performers ever. But behind the glitz and glamour, there might be more to her story. Many who've worked with her say she was tough to handle. She was a perfectionist who wanted things her way, even if it meant stepping on others. Some even say she played d to climb the ladder of success. It seems like success might have gone to her head, revealing her darkest side in the process. 
These are the hidden sides of Diana Ross that Gladys Knight thinks it's time to uncover. The interesting thing about Gladys Knight's claims is that she's not just talking from her own experiences. There have been many other stories out there suggesting that Diana Ross might have had a darker side to her journey to fame and fortune. As a fan, you've probably heard some of these stories before. But what sets Gladys's revelations apart is that there's still a lot more messed up stuff about Diana Ross that never made it to the headlines. There have been rumors that Florence Ballard and Mary Wilson from the Supremes remembered a Diana Ross who always wanted to stand out from the rest of the group. Whether it was by positioning herself on the opposite side of the stage or skipping her part of their matching costumes just before they went on stage. Turns out, she wasn't just like that with her own group members. Other people in her line of work also felt her wrath. A few years back, the Empress of Soul shared a tale about how Diana Ross got her and the Pips kicked off a tour. Gladys Knight's journey into music began in the 50s when she was just a young girl. In those early days, the Pips signed with Fury Records and toured around the South. But things really took off for Gladys Knight and the Pips when they started working with Motown around 1966. They began collaborating with producers on Barry Gordy's famous label, selling millions of records in the late 60s and early 70s. As the lead singer, Gladys often took center stage with her powerful vocals. During their early days at Motown, they even opened for the Supremes. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. In a 2015 interview on Sway's Universe, Gladys addressed the infamous rumor about Ross kicking them off a tour. She prefaced the story by saying she likes to be nice, but also truthful. She said, We were on tour with the Supremes, and we were doing colleges and some stuff like that, and we opened for them. Knight said that one night, after a performance, they left the stage pumped up. Their road manager then dropped the news that Mr. Gordy was on the phone. They were thrilled because they wanted to do their job well. Came back and said, Mr. Gordy would like to speak to you. Uh oh, you know what and that what means? what happened? I said, really? He said, well, I see you out there upset my act. I said, what? He said, well, you give him a little hard time. She said, so I got on the phone and he said, hey, I hear you guys are doing great out there. And I said, I hope so, Mr. Gordy. And he said, but, um, you're giving my star act a little bit of trouble. What's up with that? That's when Gordy broke the bad news. Well, I think you guys are coming home. Knight was surprised, but she remembered that just before the call, she saw Ross peeking out from behind the upper level theater curtain on stage. She said that was unusual for Ross. Knight was surprised because the Supremes were super talented and some of the biggest stars around. They ended up heading home the next day. This experience showed Knight that Ross would do anything to get her way. Little did the Empress of Soul know, her fellow group members in the Supremes had already been suffering from that. She came later on and told us that we were going home that morning. You were kidding. So we went home. Mm. Were so, you upset? Were I you wasn't. angry? What, what went through your I mind? I did not deal in drama. Without the Motown PR machine to shield her, Diana Ross's strict demands on employees and partners started to become the talk of the town. She was unapologetic about it, stating, I demand perfection from myself and the best possible job from all those around me. There were claims that Ross's daughter, Tracy Ellis Ross, acted as her mother's spy, jotting down employee mistakes in a notebook she carried everywhere. Sometimes, Ross's obsession with perfection spilled onto the stage. At Wembley Arena, she became frustrated with the sound system, stopped the show, screamed at the crew, and even kicked one of the sound monitors off the stage. One reporter later described the incident as worthy of a pill. Despite the Supreme's fame, Diana Ross acknowledged something special in her memoir, Secrets of a Sparrow. She realized how fortunate they were to achieve success while still in the moment. Ross expressed gratitude for being able to do what she loved, singing. However, life took a toll on her and her relationship with the team, leading to a very explosive fallout, especially with her relationship with the team leader. The thing about the Supremes' fallout is that it happened individually, with each friend losing touch with Diana along the way. Starting with Florence Ballard, the Supremes, Diana Ross, Florence Ballard, and Mary Wilson became pop idols, adored for their sophisticated, glamorous sound and look. So, back in 1967, the dream took a rough turn. 
Florence Ballard left the Supremes, and the group's name changed to Diana Ross and the Supremes. Barry Gordy finally put his plan into action to turn Diana Ross into the superstar diva we all know. In 1968, Florence accepted a sum of money from Motown, but had to agree never to mention the Supremes or promote herself through them, thanks to a clause in her contract with ABC Records from Motown. Unfortunately, her solo career didn't take off, and she ended up facing financial struggles. A couple of years later, she sued Barry Gordy and Diana Ross for the money she believed she was owed. She accused them of conspiring to kick her out of the Supremes, the group she helped found. Motown head Barry Gordy soon made Diana Ross the focal point of the group, thanks to her stunning looks and delicate vocals. While her voice wasn't as powerful as Florence Ballard's, it gave the group a deliberate lack of identifiable ethnicity, helping them cross over and find success with white audiences. Florence Ballard, in particular, felt resentful about being sidelined in favor of Ross in 1967. The Supremes were all set to headline a series of shows at the Flamingo in Las Vegas. Ballard was already on what Tom Mata describes as probationary behavior in his 2006 book A Lifetime to Diana Ross, The American Dream Girl, due to excessive drinking and erratic behavior. When she saw the marquee featuring the group's new official name, Diana Ross and the Supremes, Ballard reportedly fell back into drinking and angrily confronted both Gordy and Ross. It's heartbreaking to say, but Florence Ballard seemed to lose herself in the midst of it all. She was let go and replaced by Cindy Birdsong, as mentioned in her biography. After that, Ballard tried to kickstart her solo career with two singles, but they didn't make any waves on the charts. The ABC recording label even shelved her album. It wasn't the best way for things to end. But according to various sources, Diana Ross reached out to Flo when she heard she was going through tough times and offered her money. Unfortunately, Flo's husband, manager, not the best decision, ladies, messed things up, causing problems. In 1975, after Mahogany came out, Florence and Diana supposedly spoke on the phone. Flo congratulated her on the movie, but she found it hard to believe that any woman would leave a life of glamour and wealth just for a man. Quite ironic. On the personal front, Ballard married a man named Thomas Chapman, and they had three daughters together. Unfortunately, they hit a rough patch and separated for a while. During this time, Ballard had to rely on public assistance to get by. In 1975, Ballard's luck started to change when she won an insurance settlement. She also reconciled with Chapman and began performing again. She even made an appearance at a concert alongside the group Deadly Nightshade. However, tragedy struck when she passed away due to complications from alcohol abuse and long-term depression, which ultimately led to cardiac arrest. She was just 32 years old, and her death deeply affected Diana Ross. Despite the devastation of losing Ballard, Ross pushed forward with her singing career. She continued to rack up more number one songs, including the hit Upside Down. In 1981, she performed the theme song for Endless Love, composed by Lionel Richie. That same year, Ross left Motown Records and signed deals with record companies worldwide. She even formed her own production company. The following year saw the release of Silk Electric, an album featuring the song Muscles, written and produced by Michael Jackson. A lot of fans think that Diana's actions pushed Florence into financial struggles and stress, which led her to start drinking. But even with all that going on, Diana seemed unfazed. She kept on with her career and even started her own production company. Some fans think Diana was only interested in building her own empire, even if it meant pushing everyone else aside. Despite all the drama, many fans still admire Diana's talent. They believe her voice truly made her a star. Her singing is something people still remember and appreciate to this day. That's it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching.